Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And of course, I'm hopeful that you'll be joining us for the entire weekend. This is just the opening shot of a, what I believe is going to be a supernaturally wonderful conference. Uh, it is about the presence of God. Nothing else matters except His presence in our life. This weekend is, you know, our dedicated weekend to pursue that glory. And I want that to be your mindset. Of course, it's good to visit and to see people and uh, be together as the body of Christ. That's exciting in and of itself, but don't let it overshadow the main reason we're here, and that's to have more of God. Amen. Amen. Let me just thank you again for being here. Of course, whether you're online or you're here in person, we're excited about the connection. Uh, you know, God is in the business of connecting people. And whatever way he has to, whatever way he can. And so I would encourage you to, to value the connections he brings you into. Bible says he orders the steps of a good man or a good woman. That means that the connections with people you come into aren't coincidental. And treasure them, cultivate them, and continue to nurture them by reconnecting as many times as you can. And this is particularly important when it concerns the church that it's pleased God to put you in. There are notions in some quarters of the body of Christ that it's okay just to kind of float around. It is not. According to the Bible, there is a place that has pleased God to plug you in, and that's where your greatest growth in God, the greatest maturity of your faith is going to be found. And so I would encourage you, to reconnect if you've never been here before. Don't consider this a unilateral decision you made to come for this special conference. And we've got some speakers we haven't had before because I'm excited about moving into other streams and other arenas of ministry. Amen. And so it's significant that you, you know, keep the connections going, keep the connection strong. If this is your first time here, it's not just because you decided to come. God ordered your steps. And whether you're online or in here, reconnect over and over again and let's watch him use the relationship uh, in both directions to promote his purposes in our life. So thanks for being here. We certainly appreciate this opportunity to pursue God with you. Oh, by the way, I'm Mac Hammond. My wife Lynn and I pastor Living Word. So... Thanks for being here once again. Amen. Well, are you ready to give to the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. This should be an occasion for celebrating. Every time we, we have an opportunity to give to the Lord, reminds me of a joke. Um, I'm not really much into jokes, guys, but this every now and then, it's, uh, there's a good one comes to mind. But I'm sure you heard about the pastor that got up in front of his congregation one Sunday morning and said, well, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is we've got all the money we need to build our new sanctuary. The bad news, it's still in your pocket. <laughs> so one of the primary pastoral responsibilities is to get the money out of your pocket and into the offering plate. Now, you think I'm teasing. Now, I'm not into money just to the extent that it enables ministry, but I am into your growth in God. And so I'll never be shy preaching about money. It's one of the most fundamentally important understandings we need to have in the Word of God. And so, you know, don't make the mistake of saying, well, all Pastor Mac wants to do is raise money for the church. There is a little bit of truth in that. I am interested in the ministry having enough financial capacity to do all that God's called us to do. But as I said uh, recently, maybe it was last week, uh, my, the measurement of my success as a pastor by the Lord is going to be the fruit that you bear. And the fruit you bear will be very limited if you don't understand the word about money. So let's look very briefly at Luke 16, 10, before we receive the offering. 
long time ago when we started the ministry, the Lord told me not ever to ask for money, but share the word before the offering because it's the word that produces fruit. Luke 16, 10 and 11 will begin in 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. Faithfulness is huge. It's the faithful man that gets promoted. It's the faithful man that abounds with blessing. And faithfulness to God means living our lives on the basis of his word and making him our number one pursuit in life. But he's going to say something really important. He establishes this, that there is something called the least that we have to first be faithful in. And in verse 11, we see what that is. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Well, there are a couple of important things we should be mindful of. Uh, unrighteous mammon isn't an indication that money is evil. There is just no inherent uh, righteousness or unrighteousness. There's no inherent good or evil in money. It's how it's used. And he says, if you are faithful in managing your money, the implication is you will be granted the true riches. Many people make the mistake of measuring uh, how rich they are by their bank balance. And God said that's the wrong point of measurement. True riches have to do with your heart condition. True riches have to do with the peace of God, the joy of the Lord, the anointing and anything the anointing will bring to pass. But he said, before that can be experienced by you, before you can experience the true riches, you're going to need to be faithful in doing what the Lord says do, to do with your money. And he said in the previous verse, if you're unfaithful in this, which he calls the least, you're not going to be faithful anywhere else. Hard message for a lot of people to hear. But all that says or should say to you is that you're placing more importance on money than you are the Lord. If we were to read a little bit further in this passage, he says you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon being a reference to the God of this world. Money is nothing but a medium of exchange that represents the world that we live in. And if you're not faithful in doing with your money what God says, then you're serving mammon by default and don't even know it. God's primary competition for your heart isn't Hinduism or Buddha or any other world religion. It's money. And so to that end, we need to begin managing our money like God says. And basically, this isn't going to be a comprehensive teaching on what that is. But you would know that it would include the tithe, the first 10% of your income, should go to the Lord. It's not arbitrary. He says, bring your tithe to the storehouse. And he said, that's not discretionary because the tithe belongs to him. And then beyond the tithe, there is sowing of seed in the enablement of the preaching of the gospel. Money is never referred to as seed unless it supports the preaching of the gospel because as Jesus said, the spiritual seed you want to get planted is the word of God in other hearts. So when money is talked about in the scripture as sowing and reaping, it's talking about utilizing your finance to enable the preaching of the gospel, which is how the spiritual seed gets planted that's going to change somebody's life. So there's the tithe and there's the sowing of seed beyond the tithe. Tithing isn't sowing. Sowing is related to the discretionary use of income that you do have uh, the you know, ability to make choices about. The tithe, you really don't. God says it belongs to him. So these are things we need to consider and rehearse occasionally so that when we have an opportunity, we do with our money as the Lord says we must and serve God instead of serving mammon. I would encourage you every time you give, see it as an opportunity to move your heart closer to the Lord 
than it was before. Because as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Let's pray before we receive the offering. And of course, if you're online right now, you need to be involved in the offering as well. Just follow the prompts on your screen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. And we do so not simply to receive. We do so to experience you in a greater measure as we are faithful to use that which is least in order to honor you. So we bring our tithes and our offerings to the storehouse today with a glad and cheerful heart. We thank you in advance for meeting all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now as the ushers receive the offering, uh, I have one quick announcement to make and uh, you'll, you'll notice that uh, most of the announcements have been dispensed with. Now they'll, they'll show up again on Sunday, but they've been dispensed with uh, for the services leading up there. With one exception, I want you to be mindful of the fact that a week from tomorrow night, we have our night to honor Israel. And uh, it's an important event in the life of this church. And of course, uh, you know, we've got some awesome uh, guest ministry coming. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley will be here. Uh, you don't want to miss Nikki. And then, of course, Pastor John Hagee, Christians United for Israel, will be here. And we have some special music planned, a drumming group called Stickyard. And they will flat rattle your cage in a good way. And so, basically, uh, put next Sunday night, a week from tomorrow, or a week from day after tomorrow, uh, on your calendar and be sure you're, you're here for that event. Praise the Lord. Let's stand, please. Let's take a moment and stand up. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. And we have someone with us tonight for this whole weekend uh, that we're truly honored to have. Leif Hetland uh, is a global ministry all over the world. He has taken the message of God's love. Uh, I'm so excited to have him here I want that excitement to infect you. Uh, would you please give Leif Hetland a warm welcome to our pulpit as he comes to share the word. Thank you, Leif. I love you too. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Can we just hold, can we just hold out our hands for a few moments and just honoring King Jesus. Let's just honor His presence in this place. When we have His presence, we have everything. And if we have everything and we don't have His presence, we have nothing. We just worship you, Jesus. We just thank you, Jesus. We thank you that there is healing in the name of Jesus. So be healed in the name of Jesus. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. So be free in the name of Jesus. Because whom the Son set free is free in thee. Father, I just thank you that Jesus, the royal Son, Jesus, the Prince of Shalom, of wholeness, will just linger over this meeting. And I'm just asking that even today we're going to get a fresh upgrade in love. That we're going to have a fresh baptism of love and a baptism of fire so that we will burn brightly without burning out because we're going to burn oil and oil of intimacy with our lover. So, Father, just bring glory to yourself this evening. I just thank you, Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit, that you are the most real person in this room, and we just honor you. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to take over and take control. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... And just wave to me and smile. Let me see all of you. Wow. <laughs> you may be seated. Oh. <laughs> You're allowed to laugh here in Minnesota. <clears throat> I am, uh, I'm going to take a few moments. My name is Leif Hetland. 
And uh, somebody just called me Leif, but my name is Leif. <laughs> and it sounds like safe. Leif is safe. So Leif Hetland, and I am from the country of Norway. So yes. Born and raised in Norway. And I'm going to take a few moments today, actually share a little of my story and my testimony, uh, just so that uh, you can know, because I know everyone here has a story. But a beautiful part in the kingdom is that Jesus will never treat you based upon your history, but your destiny. And so there is a beautiful destiny over everyone that is in this room. Uh, I have had the honor of being married to a Cherokee Indian, Jennifer, for 33 years. And, uh, and I'm a happily married man. And then we have four children. We have a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law. And we have another one about to get married in Stavanger, Norway, in July. So she's marrying a Norwegian. So we are a very international family. And... Uh, our son-in-law is African-American, so I hope we're going to have chocolate grandbabies in the future. So here we are, a multicultural family, and, uh, and it is good for me to be here with this family, and Pastor Mac and Pastor Lynn, and, and also it's good to be again with you, Joseph. But just, this is like a family time for me. I feel like this is a family of families. God is a family. God is a father, God is a son, and God is a Holy Spirit. And so God is a family. My heart for us is to be able to experience the family on earth and let the family on earth look like the family on heaven. Papa God, he doesn't want visitation. He wants habitation. And I believe many of us, we've been praying for the fire while God has been looking for healthy fireplaces. Because the fire belongs to fireplaces. So it is an incredible honor for me, and I, I wanted to take a few moments and just share a little bit of my journey, testimony. I have these three cheers up here, and I'm actually sharing this in honor of Pastor Lynn, but I think there's a fresh message. Actually, I was in my room about four o'clock this afternoon, and, and the presence of Jesus just started to minister to me, and, and whatever overwhelms you shapes you. And I just started to feel, I got so overwhelmed, and I could feel, and that's why I feel tonight, uh, there's going to be something on the fire of God. I just felt the flames of love, the fire of love is going to be released in a special way, because I know He started to do something with me, and it's not always pleasant, but it is good. And sometimes He does something deeper before He can take us wider. And so anyway, a little bit of my story, if we took, if you took me on a journey about 57 years ago, I'm 56 years old. But 57 years ago, I was in my mother's womb, and she was pregnant with me, and then she found out during the time she was pregnant that she had to have a major surgery. And as they were cutting in her, I was about four months old in my mother's womb, and I didn't realize at that time period that I came into this world with fear. It was many years later that I didn't recognize there was something about fear in regard to, and some of that was the trauma of that four and a half months, and what my mom was feeling all during this time while she was carrying me. And later on, when I was about 12 years old, I came from a godly home. I was very blessed to be Norway, as you know, as Lutheran. But uh, we were among the 7% of the population that were born again Christian. So I was part of a good Christian family in Norway. My mom and dad were believers. But when I was 12 years old, somebody attacked me, and this abuse took place. And then the next thing that happened in my life, shame came in. And then so I ended up from I was about 13 years old. Because when you have pain in your life, that pain seeks pleasure. And so when you have a black hole in your soul, you're looking for something. And for me, I ended up in rebellion. And I ended up as a prodigal son. So for the next five years, I moved away from God's love. I moved away from God. I moved away from Jesus because I felt in my heart that after everything that has happened to me, where were you, God? And I went in rebellion. And when I was about 18 years old, I ended up suicidal drug addict. I weighed about 99 pounds. I'd just been kicked out of a boarding school, ended up in a park in Oslo. And I started this journey of coming home to my family and my parents, and, and they loved on me. But during this journey, when I was about 18 years old, uh, somebody shared uh, Jesus with me. And I had an encounter with Jesus where he saved me, and he healed me, and he delivered me, and he set me free. Yes. Wow. 
that at the age of 18, I, I experienced Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus. And after Jesus, what he has done for me, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to give my life to him. And I left my country, Norway, first for Germany, and later on, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland. And some of my accent is kind of a mix between Irish and Scottish. I had my first experience with the Holy Spirit in a Catholic church. <laughs> after Mass... So God is good. <laughs> but the problem for me, I went from rebellion to religion. I went from being a prodigal son to become a prodigal brother. And in the next moment, what I started to do, I started to live for God instead of from God. Let me say that one more time. I started to live for God instead of from God. And as a result of that, I was out there on the field now because after what Jesus did for me, here's what I'm going to do for him. And I'm about to use this to be able to provide a little bit of language to my message today. But I'm going to need some help. So are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. So I have these three chairs with me today that's going to help a little bit with my story. I actually have a message from the Bible, but I wanted to connect a language that I think is going to be helpful for us on this conference or this event, I, I would call it more a family gathering than a conference. Because I, I really sense in this family feel here. I'm seeing also three generations. I see grandmas and grandpas here. I see fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. If you have three generations, you can change cities and nations. You have father, son, spirit. You have nations. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You have nations. And I do believe that God is thinking in generation, and we're seeing that here. The next revival in America is not the youth revival. It is a family revival. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why the enemy is so nervous about family. That's why you see the attack on family, on marriage, on children, the next generation. The reason there's attack on the baby in the mother's womb is because there's a generation of forerunners that God wants to raise up, and the enemy is aware of it. And he's trying to stop a whole generation. But what we realize when you see what the enemy is doing, it's easy for us to see what God is doing. Because when a thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, that's what Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. And it is going to be so important, but I believe I'm going to be able to provide a little bit of language for us today. And my goal before this evening is over is that you are going to be a chair number one believer. And if you're married, you're going to live a chair number one marriage. And if you have a business, it's going to be a chair number one business. And if you have a church, it's going to be a chair number one church. And we're going to learn a little bit about that today. So I have these three chairs with me. This is chair number one. Which chair is this? This is chair number two. Which chair is this? And this is chair number three. Which chair is this? Everyone in the world, they're living their life from one of these three perspectives. You are either going to be a chair number one person, chair number two, or chair number three. I'm going to kind of simplify the world of 7.8 billion people. They're living their life from one of these three perspectives. If you live your life in chair number one, it is all about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. The Bible says he first his kingdom, and it is his righteousness, not my righteousness, but his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Bible says unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. The Bible says repent, for the kingdom is at hand. This is all about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. But if you live your life in chair number two, it is about the kingdom of self, the kingdom of self. The people that are operating in chair number two is all about peace. If you touch the rest of the day, you need peace. My friend, let me just come to go the song, There is none like you. And I sang this song I, in chair number two. I say, Lenny, there is none like me. <laughs> and Lenny said, no, 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 there is... And he recognized the difference of the chairs. But a lot of people, they had been in chair number two. I was just in Australia before COVID-19. And one lady had come and traveled. I had just been at Promise Keepers. No, excuse me. At, uh, I had been at Planet Shakers in Melbourne. And then I went up to a place outside Brisbane. And this lady came up to me. And the service went on for over two hours of extravagant worship. It was beautiful. But this one lady, she was upset. And she came to me and says, Oh, Pastor Leif, I watch you on Sid Roth, and I just 
love your teaching. I came here to hear you, but I can be honest, I didn't like the worship. And I said, well, that's okay. It was not for you, it was for him. <laughs> so there are so many people in chair number two. And then the world is in chair number three. Say chair number three. And this is about the kingdom of the world. Say kingdom of the world. If you live your life in chair number one, you are saved. Say the word saved. Saved. You live your life in chair number two, you are saved. Say the word saved. Saved. And I know some people will argue with me, like one of my friends who is an Assembly of God pastor, he actually came to me when I was over at Redeem Love, Redeeming Love in in St. Paul. And he said, I don't believe the person in chair number two can be saved. And I said, that's okay. In your sermon, they can be lost. In mine, they are saved. But if you live your life in chair number three, you are lost. Say lost. Lost. And the majority of the world's population live in chair number three. Actually, to be honest, the majority of America is in chair number three. And people are living in darkness. They are lost. And I'm about to show you how I believe we're going to see transformation. And this is what I believe uh, uh, much of this event this weekend is about. Because first of all, we need to have a transformation. Because transformed people bring transformation to people. And it starts with me, and that's what I felt even when I was in my room. I realized that even what's going on in the Middle East, I'm about to be in Afghanistan next month, and then back in Pakistan, and I was sharing with Pastor Mac, I'm heading into one area for the last 10 years. I've tried for 10 years to go into this area. One and a half million people live there. They have never once heard the name of Jesus. Not one believer, not one intercessor, not one person. For 2,000 years, there's never been light, only darkness. And every time I've tried, there's been supernatural things stopping, including last year. There was not a rain season. 12 hours, a storm followed me everywhere I went and just had filled up the whole stadium of rain and destroyed everything. When there's no rain season, there was all these demonic things that is trying to stop. Why? Because there's a destiny for that region. So I just felt the Lord said, it's time for you to walk on water again. Get out of the boat. Keep your eyes on Jesus, but there's something he has on the other side. So I don't know what storms you have been in or what serpents you have faced in this season, but there's something God has on the other side. And we have to be aware of that. So I just recognize it, but I realize I don't have what it takes. Light penetrates darkness, but glory penetrates gross darkness. And we need to go into the glory. And no longer sin management, chair two, but glory management, chair one. So chair number one is all, it is the spirit-filled life. Say spirit-filled life. The Bible says those who are led by the spirit, they are the sons and daughters of God. In chair number one, if you live in chair number one, you know the evidence is the supernatural is what's natural. If you live in chair number one and I squeeze you, what's in you comes out. It's going to be love, joy, peace, patient, kindness. When somebody in traffic bumps into you, the sweet lady drives in front of you and you get an upgrade in patience. The fruit of the Spirit. I had one person said, he said, don't humiliate me. And I said, you cannot humiliate somebody that is humble. You can't hurt a dead person. (laughs) I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. So chair number one, I I know myself, and we're going to see that. You're going to see how I end up in chair two quite a few times. Ask my wife. And we're going to learn a little bit about that. Chair number two is the soulish life. Say soulish life. The people that are operating in chair number two, it is by their emotion, will, mind, and personality that is running it. That doesn't mean that God doesn't speak, but it has to filter its way through your soul to touch your spirit. While when you're in chair number one, you have the spirit, soul, body, and there's life flowing out of you. While you are in chair number two, the soul is the dominating force. So when God speaks, you have to feel. You have to filter its way through your mind to touch your spirit. So you do not know if this is, if this is God's voice or your voice or the devil. And let me just say something. Deception is very deceiving. (laughs) 
And, and the reason I'm saying that 93% of the believers are in channel number two most of the time, based on most of George Barna research and survey. And then we're wondering why the world is lost, why the world is in darkness, why we are not influencing the world. The world is actually influencing us. So my thing here, so this is the spirit-filled life, this is the soulish life, and then you will find out the world looks pretty much like chair number two. The same temperature you see here is often reflected in the wall. And my, this, my assignment, I wrote a book that is out there called Call to Rain, and I saw my friend Rick just have it. But that's all about getting the super glue for you to be in chair number one. The whole, if I take the root system of chair number one, it is love. And the book of Ephesians says that you are rooted and grounded in love. Hey, you are rooted and grounded in love. 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 Oh, high and deep and wide and long is Papa God love for me. Rooted and grounded in love. Be careful, all you Vikings. Because when the meeting is over, you will walk around in the restaurant, rooted and ground in love. Rooted and... and be careful here in Minnesota. This kind of a thinking can lead to dancing. And you can become a joyful Christian. And maybe the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Because in His presence, there is fullness of So anyway, so this system, if I'm going into the root system of that, it takes you back again to who you were before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, where you were pre and destined in love. You didn't start. I didn't start out that four and a half months baby. I didn't start out even with conception. I started out in the mind of God. And I was there with him in the beginning. Holy and blameless. I started out in glory. What sin made me fall short of glory. But what Jesus came was to restore you back to glory because you are glorious. And if we're going to go from glory to glory, the starting point has to be glory. If you're going to go from faith to faith, then the starting point has to be faith. So my thing is not to do anything of just doing a diagnosis from chair two so we can start to see that, but it's going to give you an invitation to have an upgrade and to repent. Say repent. repent. That means you go back in the penthouse where you belong. You repent. <laughs> Why would you want to live in the basement when you can live in the penthouse with Papa God? <laughs> Metanoia. So here we are, chair number one. When I'm in chair number one, I'm going to just kind of describe it. When I'm in chair number one, it is called the hard work of rest. Because when you are at rest, the Holy Spirit finds a resting place. The dove rested upon Jesus. Why would you want to have visitation in chair number two when you can have habitation in chair number one? When you are in chair number one, you are seeing his face. You're hearing his voice. My sheep hears my voice and follow them. When you are in chair number one, you're experiencing his love. And you're not looking for love in the wrong places. Because when you have love deficiency, you have God deficiencies. Because God is love, 1 John 4, 16. And then he says, as I am, so are you in the world, 1 John 4, 17. So I'm just putting a framework so we can see, because when you have love deficiency, that's the root system of everything. His holiness is love. Everything is love. So chair number one, when I'm in chair number one, when I'm this place, the supernatural is what's natural. And I'm going to just kind of describe, as you can see, a little bit of my life, telling a couple of stories so you can see how this is operating. A few years ago, uh, I often going into the Middle East, and I had an assignment, because what the enemy is trying to do in this season, let me just be a little coach for a moment, leadership coach. Be aware of what is your gainers and what is your drainers in your emotional tank. Because the enemy's weapon in this season is trying to wear you out. 
So what is happening? Being aware of your emotional time. What is your income and your expense? So what the enemy is doing, you see that Elijah, 1 Kings 18, in chair number one. 1 Kings 19, super glue in chair number two. And one Jezebel get him to run for his life. So how could this man that changes the environment to get fire from heaven, how could this same guy become suicidal 72 hours afterwards? One of the greatest prophets. And the thing, it started with fatigue. Watch his whole pace. Look at the prayer meeting. Look at everything he did. It starts with fatigue, and then the enemy pushes the button of fear. And when fear comes in, you get in the wrong chair. Chair two is fear-based. And when there's fear, you have to have control. I have to have a bigger stick than you, and I can control you. Chair number one is about freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. But when I get into chair number two, fear, and fear is false, evidences appearing real. 95% of what you fear will never happen. But what the enemy gets you into from fatigue, fear comes in. The next thing the enemy says, you fail. Failure comes in. And the next F after that is forsaken. He isolates you. And there's some people even in this room, you're alone, feeling you're the only one that's going through that, and you're stuck here. And then the enemy comes in, and he starts to overwhelm you. What's happening? And you're listening to the news, and you're looking at the watch and say, come, Jesus. Well, he's saying, go, church, go, because he's not coming until you're going. <laughs> when I'm here, I start to see how big Goliath is. When I'm in chain number one, I see how big God is. When I'm in chair number two, if you touch the lepers, you become unclean. If you're in chair number one, if you touch the lepers, they become clean. It's a whole different way of living and loving, even on finances and everything else. Here you were focusing on what we don't have. Here I'm saying I have loaves and fishes. Who do we feed? And 12 baskets left over. It's a whole different operating. The kingdom is a different operating system, but it's connected to sons and daughters. But when you operate in chair number two, you're operating like an orphan instead of a beloved son and daughter. And Jesus says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. And let me be honest. The majority of the churches are operating more like orphanages than healthy family. And orphans are coming together and orphans compete with one another while sons and daughters complete one another. And I believe we need an orphanectomy. God started out as a family and he ends with a family represented from every nation, tongue, tribe, and language. It started well and it ends well, by the way. I'm not saying it is a, not a bumpy road, but I've read the book of ending. And it ends well. It started with God and it ends with God. Not with the devil. It is not the book of Antichrist, it is the book of Jesus Christ. When I'm in chair number one, I'm anointed. When I'm in chair number two, I'm annoying. <laughs> when I'm in chair number one, I'm pretty prophetic. When I'm in chair number two, I'm pretty pathetic. <laughs> and can I just be honest here? I just wanted to be real with you guys because a little bit of my journey, as I said, I'm putting myself. So here I am, Norwegian, mentioned I got saved at the age of 18 making just a couple of highlights, ended up serving Jesus, went to Bible college, seminary, got married, ended up as a pastor, first in a Presbyterian church while I went to school, then moved back to Norway, and I was a Baptist pastor in Norway. But then we had one of our church members, and by the way, I operated from chair two. I didn't even know chair one existed. I didn't. I have a friend of mine who built a mega church, and he says, I didn't know chair number one existed. I did everything. This is what I did for God because I didn't know how to do it from God. I built a bat. Chair two is a babel. Well, we're doing all of this from earth to building as close to heaven we can get. While chair number one is a battle, which is a open heaven and the house of God. 
So I'm here in my Bible doing the best that I can for God. And, but when I don't do enough, because in the inside, when you have an orphan heart and an orphan spirit, I'm looking for validation because in the orphan world, you have to do. Say, I do. And then I have. Say, I have. I and then you become. I become. Say, I become. I become. Welcome to the orphan world. And Lucifer was the first orphan. So when he left heaven with one third of fallen angels, they no longer had a home. And the one strategy for the enemy is he's not afraid. He's afraid that beloved sons and daughters are going to come home. Stepping into their identity, and out of that identity, intimacy. And out of that intimacy, stepping into all the inheritance, because the inheritance is for sons and daughters. Chair number two is about convenient relationship. Chair number one is about covenant relationship. And even there's a lot of people right now in chair two, they are coming there and they're very frustrated in this season because they have words over their life, they have prophecy over their life, but they don't have the wedding band. They're just for another date with Jesus and not realizing you're married to him. And it is about covenant relationship with a covenant-keeping God. And the promises are yes and amen, but it's connected to relationship. So if you, like one person, came up to me in a meeting and said, I had this prophecy about this vision and a dream. Well, the prophecy came in a seed format. And then you have to go through the process. But before that happened, you need to get married to him. So that then you could start the journey and then you need to have intimacy to become one with him. Then all those things that was prophesied will start to happen. But that person is frustrated because they came from a place of chair two. And then they are frustrated with him. They maybe had a robe. And chair number two, you maybe have a robe. Say robe. And you will get to heaven because of the robe of righteousness. But if you don't have the ring, say ring. Heaven will not get to you. Can I say that again? In chair number two, the prodigal son, he got a robe. Say robe. And the robe gets you to heaven, the robe of righteousness. But the next thing is the ring, covenant, signature ring, sonship, daughtership, becoming one with him. The ring brings heaven to you. The identity is in the robe, but the authority is in the ring. And this is not my sermon. This is just my warm-up. I'm just sensing this. I don't know if it is helpful. But I'm I'm just... Because for me, this is very simple. In a moment, I'm in chair number one. I'm in my room, and the dove comes down. I'm worshiping. And then I can get one phone call, and something comes in, and the next moment, I'm in chair number two with pigeons. (laughs) And pigeon religion is different than when the dove is there. And the pigeons makes a lot of mess. I, I give you a practical example. I just I was in one of those meetings just recently, and we were there, and the glory is there, created miracles. Just two weeks ago, we are there, and there's the glory, and woo. And then I'm coming home, and my wife just said something. Why are you so late? Couldn't the meeting stop? And I, wow. <laughs> Chair two. And then it gets worse. Now, in the next moment, I blame her that I got here. (laughs) It is your fault that I, he did or she did. Can I be brutal honest with us? In this last couple of years, I will be honest anyway. (laughs) Pastor Lynn told me to be myself, and I'm free. I just want to be honest. You're going to see the good, bad, and the ugly, but God uses all things for good. So I can't lose when I continue to live a lifestyle of repentance. So when I get into this chair, then through humility, because there is grace for the humble, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And then coming to my wife and say, I'm so sorry. Not point to what she did, but this is what I did. But here's what I'm saying. Even with a political climate, let me just be clear, the Black Lives Matter and all the different, I know we're in Minnesota, and all the things that's been going on. Yes, if you don't like what I'm saying, say, he's a Norwegian, he doesn't understand. <laughs> I get to, I'm getting away with, oh, English is a second language. <laughs> he didn't mean it. 
Well, let me say it anyway. The arguments that I'm hearing from the prophets to everything of the debate that has been going on is in chapter number two, where we are actually in the tree of knowledge of good and evil yeah. instead of the tree of life. Yeah. And so the honest, we just choose who is good and then the other one is evil. And so in the orphan war, which of the orphans do you like best? And then we defend that as it is kingdom. And then here we have prayer meeting in chair number two. We need to pray for America. We need to pray the evil is coming and it's getting worse. It's getting... We need to pray intercessor. Pray. Oh, gosh, oh, God, God, God. I'm desperate. So we're asking God to do what he's called us to do. So we call it prayer and God call it disobedience. So there's things he's asked us to do in regard to this world. And I'm asking God to do what he had just called me to do. I, I believe in intercessory prayer. And that's why I can be honest with you. Say, when I got this invitation, I'm honest with you. Because I get over 400 invitations a year. And I've been blessed in this area. I have a lot of friends. But the thing that excited me the most, I knew Lynn and her intercessors. And if you're an intercessor, I need you. Because I need chair number one intercessors that are rooted and grounded in love. They know who they are and whose they are. They're coming from a place of identity. It's daughters and sons of a good, good papa. People that are living from heaven towards earth. That are changing the environment because their environment has changed. That is not being overwhelmed by this wall, but being overwhelmed by him. So nothing else can overwhelm you. So I'm coming here a little selfish. I need you to remember this Norwegian face. Underneath these fancy clothes, I have a lot of scars. And 90% of the scars I have on this body, I wouldn't have if I've had some of those intercessors. That was my biggest reason. Honest. That's, I learned much more. I met an incredible apostolic father and teacher that I have honored on a distance. And I met so many more. There were more I got. But I'm saying for me, that's my heart. So my heart is to raise. So for people to know, the same with prophets. We've had a lot of prophets. They are my friends. But even with all the prophetic, what we don't understand, when we don't love this world. Listen, we only have authority over what we love. Yes. And moment you're coming in from fear and anger towards this world, you lose your authority. You can be here as a roaring lion and you can roar against this wall. But there's also a lion there that seek who may might devour. And that lion there is not afraid of this lion here. Or this lion is not afraid of that lion. But right here there's a secret. It's called the lamb. Jesus the lamb. And what he's doing when we are in his presence, the one we are beholding is the one we are becoming. And the one we are becoming... It's the one that we be like. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is 24 times lamb and only one time lion. And what actually crushed the enemy was the lamb. So what God is doing in this season, and the lamb in me, I'm going to share a couple of stories that's connected to this. So I was on this trip to the Middle East, and I landed eventually first in Dubai and came into Islamabad and came to my hotel 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm tired, and I'm in still in chair one and praying in the spirit. It's hard. And then right outside the prayer, the first prayer in the morning. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh, I miss, miss my wife and my kids. And be, instead of shining, I was whining. I know I'm in chair two by then. So it didn't take long because of the fatigue, the small little things the enemy pushed the button of fear. And when I get in chair number two, I don't see things the way the world is. I see things the way I am. And when I'm in chair number two, I don't have a proper perspective. I, don't, I cannot see this world from a proper perspective. There was 10 scouts. They defined what they saw from here. There was two other ones. Joshua and Caleb had a different perspective. You have all the Israelites. This is what they saw. But we saw there was somebody else and he saw something different. David. 
And he had his wedding band. That's why he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That's covenant. He is not in covenant. We are in covenant. The war is over. Jehovah Sabbath, God is my warrior. The war is over. We are in covenant. Have you forgotten who you are? And we have the circumcising our hearts in this season that are laminous, the rise and shine, for the light has come. In the book of Revelation, it's not going to be sun or moon. It's going to be the lamb that is going to lit up the whole universe. And it's going to keep it. And then there's a lamb in you. And when that lamb gets on fire, something starts to burn in you and you will be a light. And then the roaring, the identity is in the lamb, and then the authority is in the lion. And when you start to roar, people will gather, not scatter, because it comes from the lamb's heart. Let me try to say that one more time. When we roar, our authority is in the lion, but our identity is in the lamb. And so the identity in the lamb, when I roar, people will gather and not scatter because it comes from the lamb's heart. Because you also have authority over what you weep over. Brokenness over what is broken. And when I see what's happening in America, when I see what's happening in Ukraine, what is happening now in Afghanistan with 20 million women and girls, there's something there, I place myself in the offering plate, and we're going to do that tonight, later on. So I'm putting this one story, and I hope we have a little time here, but ooh, this is a 12-hour message, and I'm giving to you in 44 minutes and 12 seconds. <laughs> so I ended up in chair number two, and ah. Uh, so I felt just in the morning, let me see what the news says. And they had just killed 54 people. And then I see one imam after the other imam. And it's just teaching on TV from Saudi Arabia, from all over. That's all you see early in the TV when you're in the Middle East. So I'm like, this didn't help me in chair two. I was trying to get a little encouraged. So I'm tired, I'm drained. So I'm in chair two. Oh, Rabbi Sheik, oh, Jesus, I'm desperate. There's something wrong when I'm desperate. Hunger? Yes. But when I have a desperation, my son comes into my office. He's not desperate for me. If my wife is desperate to see me, it's because something is a little disconnected with us. But I know when I'm in chair two, I often get in a desperation mode. Here I'm going into an identity and intimacy mode because I have access. What's true of him is true of me. But the problem is chair two comes into my life now and then. It comes into my marriage. It comes into my finances. It comes in and it starts to overwhelm me. And then I, this world starts to affect me, including when I'm caught alone in the Middle East. And you're stuck there in an atmosphere that starts influencing me because I don't know how to influence this world. And from chair two, it doesn't help to sweat more, try more, because flesh only produces flesh. So finally, I kind of was about to give up, and in the middle of it, the Holy Spirit whispered, and I saw this one imam, that scary looking with long beard, and this imam, as he was teaching, I was thinking, oh, kind of, a, I was judging him on TV, this evil man that is teaching, I've seen him all over the Middle East. I had that in my spirit, because that's what you do in chair two. And then the father started to say, do you see this man? I want you to see him and meet him. And I thought, that's a wrong thought. I rebuked that voice in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Uh, I can pray for him. And then I hear the whisper, you see this man on TV? I want you to meet him. And I knew, here's a little selfish for me, chair two. I know I'm not going to be able to sleep until I am obedient. So I call my coordinators. I want you to bring this, this guy on TV. And he said, he is like Oprah in America. That's how big he is. 60 million people watches him all over the world. And he's, well, he's not going to want to see you. I said, be obedient. Go and tell him that I want to see him. He's not going to do it. Do it. Chair two, I want to sleep. <laughs> My coordinator went, came back with a report. I couldn't even talk to the secretary, to his personal assistant. There's no way. And I'm like, yeah, now I can sleep. <laughs> and I tried to sleep. And then the whisper again of the dove. I have to go through my soul and my emotion to touch my spirit, but a tiny little voice, Psst, hey, I didn't ask you to try to see him. I want you to see him. And at that moment, it's, I don't know how to do that. So I repented. I went back to where I belong. I don't know how to do this. It's totally impossible. And he said, turn on the TV. Tell me, what do you see? And in chair two, I would say, I see this evil imam with long beard that teaches 
Wrong word. I mean, that's what I would see in chair two, but it is not correct because remember, he doesn't treat you. When you see the terrorist Saul, can you see the Apostle Paul? And until that comes in, you're not in chair number one. Here you can be a prophet and get a diagnosis and prophesy. You can have an Old Testament and a newspaper. And tell what's wrong with the world. So I'm in chair, back in chair one, and then the Holy Spirit starts to deal with me, and I start to weep. He said, what do you see? And I don't know, because I know the Holy Spirit is not asking because he lacks answer. He just wants me to see what the Father is seeing. And I look, and finally I say, I start in my spirit. I see a, I see a man of peace. I, I see a peacemaker. I, before you know, my spirit starts to prophesy to the television. I start to feel like, I see a peacemaker. He's going to be like an ambassador of peace. And he's going, I start to speak totally opposite of what you see in the natural. But you are operating now in the spirit here. Remember the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, in the spirit, in chair one. You're in the spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy is the evidences of the lifestyle when you're in the spirit. You're in chair number one. So from this place, I said, what do I do next? Like you're getting a word of knowledge for an elbow. God gave me a word of knowledge. And I knew it had to be God because it was so crazy. <laughs> it was like, I, heard, I felt the Holy Spirit say, go and make a $240, that's what it cost, $240 glass sculpture and present to him the International Peace Award of the Year. And maybe, let's say you are from Norway, and maybe you think it is the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so I thought, wow, that sounded amazing. <laughs> Papa. So I told my coordinator, my coordinator thought, I'm pre he is from there, from the Middle East. So he's like, no, just do it. So, but I told him, when you contact that secretary, they will deny you. All you need to say is, what is your boss going to say when he has won the International Peace Award and there's a delegation to come to honor him and you are dishonoring? What's going to happen to you? <laughs> That's called Wisdom 101. <laughs> He's not giving us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind where wisdom flows from. Full of love, full of power, and full of witness. Wisdom. So here we are. Headed there, and Dr. Bob Phillips, who was the executive pastor, with the David Wilkerson was with me. I had a few of my team members. He is in heaven today. And we ended up, and my coordinator contacted me. He, well, he doesn't want to see you. And eventually, my coordinator said, hey, guess what's going to happen to you? And he went to his personal assistant, and he said, no. And he said, guess what's going to happen to you? And he went to this man that I've seen on TV. You have won the International Peace Award. He said, I did not know that. Bring them to me. So we drove two hours into the nice fortress, guns and machine guns came there, we came in there, and I had this beautiful, and there's where one of his wives lives, another wife lives, and they hold my hand, we walked in this place, 400 imams on one side, women with a burk on the other side, I got the opportunity to present the International Peace Award. And so we are holding hands, and we're walking out there afterwards, and he I was honoring him, and what you do is, this is called covert revival. <laughs> it's a little Jehovah sneaky. <laughs> Let me fast forward a couple of years later, President Obama, part of his legacy was to do something called uh, this Freedom Act at the National Cathedral, and he wanted to bring the religious groups together and kind of had some unification thing, unity. And then several Muslim leaders from the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and a couple of ones from other countries in the Middle East was invited, and they asked me, could you come? And I was in England. I showed up to host some of those Muslim leaders and imams, and we ended up in the National Cathedral. And this one person that I talked about, he said, can I come to your home since I'm in America? And I was thinking, this is not going to be a good time because my wife, she was leading my team in England. When she arrived, I will have one of these influential imams in my house. But my wife and I, we compromised without going in chair number two. And then we compromised and we said, okay, let him stay at Wyndham Hotel. 
And then you go and pick him up, take him to your office, you spend all days with him, and we can get some halal meat or just have some dinner, and then you take him back. And, and I said, okay, honey, let's do that. So I invited him, and eventually I went to my office, and I looked around on my bookshelf, and I took the Al-Quran, I put it in Arabic on the top shelf, took the Bible on the top shelf, so I, and removed a few items in my office, made it ready for him to come, and, and it's just wisdom. So when he came into my office, he looks around in my office, and he sees the Arabic Al-Quran. He goes up there, picks it. We're sitting in the chairs, and I'm pretty tired. And he starts to read. He opened the Quran, and he starts to read in Arabic for me. And as he starts to read for me in Arabic, I can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit coming. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not a good time. <laughs> and, and it gets worse and worse, more waves, like, whoo. So he's looking at me, and I'm trying to behave, but it's getting heavy. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but I'm not saying anything. So he's reading in Arabic, and I'm tired, and then there's waves, and I'm like, whoo. And I start to see double. I see this beard and blurry eyes, and they're looking at him. And then I start to get a little laughter. I'm trying to have self-control, but it gets what? <laughs> he's reading series from the Al-Quran. I'm like, oh. And finally, he stops, and he looks up, and he says, oh, what are you doing to me? And I say, what are you talking about? He said, well, what is this tingling from the top of my head? And it's like tingling, you go up and down. Oh. Oh. I said, oh, it's just the presence of Jesus. He, <laughs> he just misses me. I've been, I was with you in Washington. I've been all over, and I just not have much time with him. He just, he just. And then I had a word. Can I pray for you? And listen, I had enough favor to pray for him, but not to touch him. So I put my hand over his head, and I said, oh, Jesus. And he just stares at me. But I had enough favor to do that. And I just prayed, oh, Jesus, just fill him up and just heal him and just bless him. And I just blessed him in the name of Jesus. And so as I was praying for that, in the next moment, what I didn't know, he just stared at me, didn't say much. And we left the next morning, picking him up at Wyndham Hotel. He stands outside. He said, you come to my room. I'm thinking, am I in trouble? He never asked me to go to his room. So I'm coming into his little hotel room, and we come down. He has his laptop open. And as I'm looking at the laptop, there's two of his wives and nine of the children there on the other side. And he said, can you give them what I've received yesterday? <laughs> so I'm there. Together with him and releases the presence of Jesus. I find out later that room just get filled with the presence over them in the Middle East. Later on, I'm in the Philippines and I'm getting this call from him. And I normally, we have a thousand of my young leaders in one of our family gatherings, we call it. And Paul Yado and all of our sons. So we are there worshiping and everything else. I normally, I'm about to speak to a thousand young leaders. And there's this WhatsApp on my phone. And I normally don't have my phone. And it is this guy. So he's WhatsApping me in the middle. So I sneak out and say, hey, what do you want? And... And uh, twice is good in English. He speaks a little English. And he said, I, I, I have my mosque full of people. And I had announced when I got home that uh, we were going to have a healing meeting. <laughs> because when I prayed over him, he had a stomach condition for 12 years that he had. So that morning at Wyndham Hotel, he went to the breakfast, uh, breakfast buffet. And he ate all this food that he had severe food allergy he couldn't eat. So he got totally healed. But more than that is when he, when he landed in the Middle East and came out and he said, he said, I don't know what is happening with me because he said, uh, uh, I come out and there's all these barren women and there's all these poor people and there's all these broken people and I don't know what's happening. I see it. It's everywhere. And he's always seen it, but everything has been in Jala. But now he's starting to have the eyes of Jesus. Now he starts to have the hands of Jesus. He's just being changed from the inside out. It's called covert revival. Transformation from the inside, you plant a seed of love. Love goes in, fear moves out. And you transform them. So in the next moment, I'm in the Philippines, releases a prayer, the presence of God. Over 200 people is getting healed in a mosque in the Middle East. And the presence, because when you're in chair number one, the eternal becomes the internal. And then you can deal with the external. Let me say that one more time. In chair number one, the eternal realm, because the spirit is eternal. It comes your internal. And when the internal has happened, then you can start to deal with the external. Jesus could sleep in the middle of the storm, for where the Father is, there's no storm. And you have, you have authority over the storms you can sleep in. 
So when there's no longer a storm on the inside, because you've learned the hard work of rest. And when you rest, the dove find a resting place. And the dove never left Jesus. It stayed there for over three years. And we have visitation of the dove, but we don't. In one moment, we have the dove and then pigeons, and we go back and forth, and that's my life. So I shared some of this story. Do we have time for about six minutes just to, and then we're going to minister. I just felt there was a word. I'm putting all of this together so we have a framework. Can you see the difference? Yes. And there's, so this chair is all about identity. Say identity. identity. Who are you? Second, intimacy. Say intimacy. intimacy. Where are you? Third question, inheritance. What do you have? Did Jesus get what he paid for? Everything he paid for is called inheritance. All that I have is yours. But many times we as orphans are trying to get what only sons and daughters, you can only receive it. Not to achieve it. Everything comes from him. It goes through him and back to him. It's the operating system in the kingdom. Open up to Isaiah 6, but that's what hit me. Whew. It's been hitting me this whole year, but it hit me in my room. That's when I had this nice little encounter. Wow. It's still early. Norwegian time, it's very early, I think. Just take some moments with me, Isaiah 6. In the year King Uzziah died. Say died. He saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it sto stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the servants, he flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he has taken from the, he has taken with the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has been taken away. And your sin purged. Or as I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Say that with me. Who shall I send? And... Uh, who will go for us? Say the word us. us. Say us. us. Then said I, here am I, send me. Let me try to unpack this in a few moments with the references of the cheers. Let me give you a little bit of the background. It was in the year King Uzziah died. Let me describe Uzziah to you. King Uzziah was very young when he became king, about 16 years old, and he reigned for about 52 years. You can read in the Chronicles everything he accomplished. I mean, he was phenomenal. The name Uzziah means the strength of Yahweh, the strength of God, the strength of Yahweh. He was named the strength of Yahweh, and he was probably one of the top two or three kings if you're studying the whole Israel history. When you saw, I mean, he created a catapult. This guy, I mean, he was a master warrior, and all Israel, they operated at Actually, they became head instead of tail. They became a chain of a one kingdom. Everything they touched, it prospered. It looked a little bit like heaven on earth. But over a period of time, as he succeeded and he operated in the strength of Yahweh, he actually started to step outside his lane. He was called to be king, but he started to mess around with a priestly thing. So when you're no longer operate within the realm or the lane that God has given you. And so what is happening when you're in your lane, the anointing rests upon your assignment. And your assignment is connected to your alignment. But when he moved outside that, he started to mess around with it because instead of operating the strength of God, he started to move into chair number two. And it was a subtle thing. And he started to operate in his own strength. And then he got leprosy. 
And that was also a sign there in the Old Testament that we are aware of. And he's, he's hiding up with a leprosy instead of humble himself or anything else. He again tried to do the best that he can. And it started to be manifested. Then eventually we lead into verse 1. Then eventually he died. And Isaiah the prophet, according to most historians, I mean, he was related. Some say he was the cousin of king, but he wasn't in alignment with a king. If you read a chapter before, Isaiah was probably one of my favorite chapter number two prophets. <laughs> read chapter five. What was them? What was that group? What was the Democrats? What was that group? What was... Constantly, you read a whole chapter. There's whoa, whoa, that, whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody, whoa, this, whoa. Anyone that didn't listen... And he could do that as long as it was in alignment with a governmental system that. But when that system had moved from chair one to chair two, and it was no longer operating in the kingdom, self was in the center, and they operated in their own strength, he still continued to prophesy because he was underneath that protection. But when that death happened, and this is what I believe is a prophetic picture of what's happening in our life, what's happening in America, what's happening in the world, that there's a lot of Uzziahs that are dying in this season. What is Uzziah? Anything we have relied on. In the previous season. And at that moment, there's a crisis moment. But in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. At that moment, he's pursuing God. He's in a crisis moment. And in that shift and in the transition, where you're no longer who you used to be, but you have not yet become what you're supposed to become. Then at that moment, he starts to pursue God. And he have an encounter. I saw. And what I saw, I saw the Lord. And what I saw was the Lord. And he was seated. He was seated. Where were you seated? And some of us are not seeing God where God is seated. Some of us are talking about what the devil is doing, where the devil is seated. Because we don't see God sitting on the throne. God is doing what is God's job description. God rules and God reigns. He's not nervous what is going on in Minnesota. He's not nervous what's going on. All he is doing is allowing a shaking to take place in chair two. A shaking to take place in chair number one. So they are going to discover a place that is unshakable. An unshakable kingdom. And an unchanging person. His name is Jesus. He rules and he reigns. I didn't mean to get so excited. And I'm not upset. I'm just feeling his passion. It's burning. The fire is burning. He touched me with fire this afternoon. He's breaking me over some things that is broken. And they are not the problem. I'm the problem. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the throne. And when I saw him high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled the temple. And we're experiencing that in Colorado two weeks ago when the train of his robe filled the temple. Creating miracles happened. A cessationist pastor came in with deaf ears. It just opened up. And now revival broke loose when he came home. It didn't matter if it was not a believer. The train of his robe came in and it touched the temple. And it's going to fill your temple here. And it's going to fill this temple. Because when you see him where he is seated on the throne, then the next thing you're going to start experiencing what he wants to do. And to fill us. And the purpose of the filling is the spilling. And above it stood seraphim, each one has six wings, and two is connected to worship and intimacy. Two has to do with surrender and the way you walk, and only two worked. Intercession, worship, surrender, a walk, and two. And they said, holy, 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 from every angle, holy, holy is the Lord, the host. And I want you to capture the whole earth is filled with glory. When you're in chair number one, Minnesota is full of glory. Washington DC is full of glory. All America is full of glory. The whole earth is filled with glory. If you're looking at how Israel was, it was totally mess. But he got the throne room perspective. Because when you see him, you see you, then you see the world, then you see the future. Holy, holy, shoo. And when I can start to see glory, no longer sin management. And what was then? Certainly now it's something. When I see the glory, when I see him, I start to see who he is, but also who I am. And that's the starting point before we can get the proper perspective on this world. I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with what's going on in this world. 
At first, he's allowing something to happen with Isaiah, and he becomes the very prophet that prophesies Jesus, the most incredible prophet in the whole New Testament. He's quoted more than anybody. But it is because of this change that I believe he wants to do in my life, in your life, in our life, in our church life, go from chair two to become chair number one prophet. But to do that, something needs to die so we can see him. And then get the proper perspective where he's at. And then allowing to see the worship that's going on in heaven. Stepping in to see this war from a different perspective. Because in the lenses in chair number one, when I'm going over there, in chair number two, Islam is a problem. In chair number one, Islam is a promise. And then, and the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. We've had several experiences lately when the glory starts to come in. Whoa. The first time I had it was in Kuala Lumpur. None of us could move for two and a half hours, not what even an inch. He just showed up and took over. You get undone. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man with unclean lips. Before, chair two. What was then? Now, Chair one, I see you, I see me. And then this angel came up, and I think it's interesting, he took a tongue. Why tongue? Angels are made of fire, flames of fire. But they use a tongue, and I believe there's a tongue. On the altar of heaven, there's coals of fire from each one of us. And it is so holy that angels are using a tongue, customized for each one of us. Touching our lips, and when it touches his lips, there's the cleansing and purification. But something else is so happening, you're being set on fire. You will have a new message. You will be a burning one, burning brightly without burning up. You will be passionate about something. Something is burning in me. I cannot let this, this urge just die. I cannot see these things be broken out. Something is burning on my lips because I've seen him, and I've seen you. That's not who you are. So in the middle of this Ibam, I see a peacemaker and that radical that tried to kill me for six years. I had to repent and come back. And now he's one of my closest friends. Because you don't treat people based upon their history, but their destiny. A couple of more things and we're going to have an invitation. And one of the seraphim. Behold, this has touched my lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. I also heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I'm going to land with this. When his lips got touched with fire and he had a cleansing taking place, and I think I need some purification. I'm just apologizing because with what happened in the last couple of years, that's from COVID to CDC, Black Lives Matter, you go on all over the world. And I travel around the world in the middle of the chaos. But I started to say things and speak things that was not in alignment with heaven. And I had to go through a process to humble myself and allowing that coal of fire to touch my lips. And it's a process. Touch my lips with this. Let me be broken. And I still remember one of the radical imams that this radical imam is the head of the Saudi stream in this country of, of Islam. And we came to his headquarters and his son was on ventilator, finally he had broken his neck. And I thought, wow, if you, Jesus, if I get an opportunity to pray for him, he get healed. I know the whole royal family, everybody's going to know, and this is going to explode. And I didn't realize that God has to do something with me. And I came and eventually had favor to go with this imam to the hospital and top leader, head of the political party, came and the son was then ventilated. I declared, I stood on the word of God and I talked about healing in the covenant, in the kingdom, in the precious blood of Jesus. I did everything and nothing happened. And a day later, I'm sitting in Islamabad at Marriott Hotel, totally broken hearted. And I said, God, you had an opportunity to bring glory to your son yesterday and I was pretty broken. And suddenly the Holy Spirit whispered, Leif, why do you always love with a hook? Why do you love with an agenda? I don't love you with an agenda. And I've been studying John 17, 26 for seven years. One verse, been drilling it. And it says, Father, Father, I've declared your name among them. I will declare it. The very love, Father, you have towards me, that love is going to be in them. And that's also. And then I in them, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I've been studying that verse, but I didn't know the verse was studying me. And then the voice and I have one son, Leif, Nathan, Leif Emmanuel, maybe the only regret I have in ministry in life, 
that I was gone too much when he needed me. I was all over the wall. And I was just aching. I wish I could be with Leif Emanuel and the Holy Spirit. Would you take your only son, Leif Emanuel? Let him be a vegetable the rest of his life on ventilator to exchange place with this radical Muslim. And I thought, I've rebuked that voice. And it came again the second, third, fourth. And by the fifth time, I just wept. And I said, I don't know how to love this way. And I sat there. Love just flooded over me. A Marriott Hotel, and I never forgot it. Waves of love, waves of love just came over me. I couldn't do it. I cannot give something I don't have. And as this wave came into me, 15 minutes later, we got in a call. And they said, where's Dr. Leaf? He calls me Dr. Leaf. My name is Leif. He said, where's Dr. Leaf? And my coordinate, he said, he's right here. He said, no, I swear to Allah in Urdu. I swear to Allah. He was right here in my headquarter in a whole different city. And he told me he's going to the hospital. So while I am there at one with his love, experiencing this love, somebody sees me at the headquarter. Somebody, then I'm in the hospital and the son is taken off ventilator. And I was like, and I still remember God says, this is just like a little glass of water compared to the ocean of love that I'm about to pour out. And I know that's how the world is going to see who we are because the way we love one another. And love is not weak. Yeah, you speak the truth in love. Love is very powerful. We heard Pastor Max saying that. I believe love. Love is the most powerful force. The lamb in me. Don't underestimate the power of the lamb. I have stood in the middle of 400 radicals and see the atmosphere change because of the lamb. But I know what they deserve. Can you place that on me, Jesus, so those Democrats can experience in your goodness and kindness? I would die, lay my life down on the lamb. Let Barabbas be free. I take him place. Washing the feet of Judas. That betrays me. As I have loved you. As I have loved you. Love one another. I don't know if it is just me. Maybe there's somebody else in Minnesota. Maybe you here tonight. Is there anybody else that could need an upgrade in love? Because I cannot give something I didn't have. I may be pushing this. But I do believe that my heart is to get us into chair number one. I'm going to continue in my thing on Sunday. But if I can bring us back into chair number one, your marriage is into chair number one. The people coming in and praying from chair number one, prophesy from chair number one, love and live from chair number one. And then suddenly we see him where he is actually at and having this encounter. This is not a fear thing. It's a love thing. He's not upset with you. It's an invitation for you to come home. That's where you belong. And we've been abnormal for so long that when the normal happens, we think it is strange. Anyone here that has been in chair number two ever in your life? <laughs> and if you didn't raise your hand, I'm going to walk in your shadow and everybody will be healed. <laughs> Can we stand to our feet? And I just sensing this as a moment of sod. I felt that God says, I'm going to build an altar tonight. And it's going to be an offering tonight. And guess who is going to be the sacrifice? There's freedom, the place of total surrender. To his love is the place of exchange. There's one little thing that he's doing in my life. I'm just being honest with you that he's teaching me to love me the way that he loves me. And how does that look like? And I know here, all Scandinavians at least, we're not very good at that. And I'm just sensing it's a holy love that he wants to pour. Because some of you, I can even feel it now. Some of the pain. I was actually here in St. Paul when one other lady was standing and she came up front and she couldn't even look at me. She screamed when she looked at me. And I asked, can I just give you the look of love? And she just started, ooh, she couldn't handle it. Later on, I was just went back to the hotel. I was at Redeeming Love and came out of my little hotel room and the lady was there, elderly lady. I just accidentally looked at her. She didn't have a chance to stop. And the eyes of love just went right in. And the next moment she was on the floor in my hotel on the elevator. So the year later, I came back to the event, and this lady came running up to me in the event. Said, remember me? Remember me? I am the elevator lady. <laughs> and I, I didn't remember. And she hugged me and squeezed as she told a story. And she had mental illnesses, all this medication, but at that moment, they're totally free. And since she was five years old, I'd been abused and gone through. And now at the age of 70, love went into the cracks of those foundations, like liquid love when I had a baptism of love in the year 2000. And this liquid love took this Norwegian. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit power. I'd seen a half a million people saved by the year 2000. And still I was an orphan with a black hole in my soul. 
There was still love deficiency in my life. Areas that I was not comfortable with love. But then I had a baptism of love. I had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of love went into those deep and the love went into the cracks in my foundation and, and waves. And then I heard a voice from heaven that spoke, Life, you're mine. And you're my beloved. You're my beloved son, not servant, not apostle, not doctor. You're my beloved son. Son, son, I love you, Leif. And I am well pleased with you. That moment, something broke in my life. I already have an A plus before I take the exam. I don't want to live from pressure when I can live from my father's pleasure. Something changed in this Norwegian and God starts to rewire me from love. Before I went into this world out of duty, now I went from delight. Now I go with Papa Jack on journey, no, Papa, Papa God on journeys all over the world as a little boy with a big papa. And I do strange things. I kiss people, hug people, even imams, and they kill you for it. But some of that little boy, they don't know what to do with a lamb. But they are not afraid of the lion. And when the lion shows up, justice comes in. And the girls are back in school on the border of India. We were storing the girls back. We were storing order back. Because the lion shows from the lamb's heart. The atmosphere starts to change. And I just felt tonight, is there anyone here that is hungry for a baptism of love, a fresh? And I just felt the whole altar today was going to be. This is between you and him. Just come and kneel. And I just sensed it was going to release fire. First, the liquid love was going to come. And you're going to be, it's going to go into every area of life. Holy. It's a holy, 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 holy love. The liquid love of Papa, Papa, Papa. And he's restoring our childlikeness and our innocence back. This is no condemnation. It is an invitation. It is no condemnation. Say, so you know, you're not good enough. No, Jesus is good enough. This is not coming in and saying, I wish. I remember I came to the Father, I felt, I wish I've had this earlier. I wish I could have done this earlier. What I had is love, my son and my daughter. So I wish that, and he said, no, 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 son. I'm using all these things out for good. So even if there's no place on the altar, stay where you are. Let's just hold out our hands. And I just also sensing there's some, just feeling for some of you little girls, some of you ladies, I felt first for you. I just wanted to ask forgiveness for any one of you that, had somebody that misrepresented love. And I'm a Norwegian, and maybe this is to some of the Scandinavian, but I came from a culture where affection was not normal. I came from a culture where my father provided well for me, but he didn't know how to say I love you or show affection. And some of you have had that, and some of you felt that you've come to Jesus and he is the safety. But what you didn't realize that Jesus came to show you exactly how Papa is looking like. And I felt that many of you have been unsafe from the father because of father wounds. Sure, I feel some of you had a distant father, he was not there. Some of you had an abusive father and you've been hurt. If you get close to intimacy, you're gonna get hurt again. Joseph, you also coming up and join us sing. Just join. But I'm just sensing right now that he's going to heal any of the father wounds any of the father deficiency. And I saw Papa God, he said, hi, little girl. And he's restoring your dreams again. And I saw Papa God, he was just dancing with his little girl. And I saw this beautiful little girl with a white dress. And he said, will you dance with me? And then you stepped up on his shoes. And so much, I don't know how to dance this way. There was freedom in the dance. There was intimacy in the dance. And the father, as you started to feel it, something was healed. And this is just for you just to feel. This is feeling your heart. And then in one moment, he swirled you around. He brought you back to himself. And then I saw this picture. You looked up at his face and you looked at him. And at that moment, everything changes. You knew that I am beautiful. You knew that I am valuable. He doesn't tolerate you. He celebrates you. You are Papa God's most wanted poster. It's not just that he loves you, but he wants you. And he likes you. And suddenly, something in that little girl becomes alive. And I just release in that healing, healing, healing of any father wounds. Some of the little boys, uh, teacher, I'm just going to take a cover, but I saw some of us, including people like myself. I just, it's going to go deeper. And love is going to go into the roots. And he's going to love on you in such a way 
that you've never been loved before. This love is going to go deeper than it has ever gone before. It's going to melt you. You're going to be so overwhelmed by His love. It's going to heal. It's going to restore. It's going to renew. It's going to refresh. Whoa! But I saw this picture that He reminded me in the Philippines. And I had a vision. And in the vision, I was playing basketball. And I don't know anything about basketball. But in a vision, the enemy's team had black shirts and black socks and black pants. And I knew it represented the enemy. And my team had an international team. And the score was 89 to 87. And it was a large group of thousands of people watching. And the TV camera, the world was watching. And I'm saying to the people also that are watching on television, the Father is watching you right now. You posture your heart. You position yourself right where you're at. We saw that when I was on Sid Roth and released the baptism of love. I know stories all over the place where the love moved into the living rooms, changed marriages, changed life, and started to bring transformation. So he's not limited. Whoa! His love is not limited. So Father, I just saw that picture in a moment the ball was thrown to me and i'm looking and i know i better score because if i don't score we're going to lose and the enemy is going to lose and right as i'm about to throw the ball i heard hey hey and i looked out in the audience and this man is there with a beard and he looked at me and said that's my boy that's my son Leif. that's my boy that's my son Leif." and when i looked at him and he looked at me i knew it does not matter if i score or do not score. What matters is my Father is well pleased with me. And I felt at that moment something set me free. He says, Leif, you're going to score twice as much in life if you do not play from pressure but His pleasure. You're going to see more healings if you're not so worried. What if they don't get healed? What if this happened? You're going to see more miracles. You're going to see more of everything. And something set me free that before I take the exam, the Father is well pleased with me. That I'm living is not a word for risk and faith. So, Father, I just want to release for many. It's not just for the boys or for the men, but I'm sensing here, many of us have had this pressure to perform, feeling that if I do that, the Father's going to be well pleased. And I'm here with good news. He's already well pleased with you. You already have an A+. plus. Before you do anything, you have an A+. plus. So it's time for you to go out and start to enjoy Him. So as we worship, I'm going to go around and we're going to release over you and, whoa, this ministry, but I'm just sensing that wow, as we, he's building an altar, the fire of God is going to start to touch us. And the angels have these tongues of fire from the altar, and it's going to touch our lips. Holy, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy. And it's maybe going to burn a little bit, but it's going to be good because you're going to start to be on fire again. Whoa. And the joy is coming back. The freedom is coming back. Father, I just thank you for your little girl. Your little girl. Father, I just thank you as your little girl just climbs up on Papa's lap. It reminds, whoa, it reminds me, my little girl, Lila, Baba, 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 that is melting the Father's heart. Let her rest. Just let her rest in it. Father, I just honor this Papa of the house. Honor my new brother and my new friend. Father, I just thank you. Thank you for this incredible brother of mine. Just a gift that he is and the gift that he has and the picture I saw over you Matt it was almost like Papa God gave you a piano I don't think it has anything to do with piano but that was the picture I saw and that was his gift to you but I saw how you mastered that piano how you practiced that piano that was wow your gift to Papa God and I just sensed even in this season that he's going to restore and redeem was it whoa there it is Papa. Papa. That childlikeness. Papa. Papa. So, Father, just. Let your love baptize me. Come and baptize me in your Baptize me in your love, in your love. Come and baptize me. Come and baptize me. Come and baptize. 
Fire.
just like a dance. Just enjoy the valuable. So don't do the static. This, this is a flowing dance. Ba 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 ba. It's just ba.
we're going to uh, formally dismiss. There are those that, you know, need to pick up children and children's ministry and uh, that kind of thing. If you need ministry and you want to stay, then Leif has very graciously, you know, said that he would, he would remain. So if you, if you want ministry, stay. If you have children in the children's ministry, please pick them up. Those are volunteers that are up there looking after them, and you know, that would be good to do. If this happens again, just pick them up and bring them into service. Uh, you don't have to leave. But the service is formally concluded now. Uh, I want to remind you of the schedule tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and then tomorrow evening again, uh, and then our regular service times tomorrow evening, which would be 5 o'clock, and then uh, Sunday morning at 9 and 11. I want to thank you for being a part of this. This is an important, this is an important thing the Lord is doing. So if service is formally terminated, but the move of the Holy Ghost is never terminated. So thank you for being here. And we'll see you tomorrow.